world. Thank you, everybody. And, um, you know, when I put together these talks, I often learn something. And when I put together this talk, I went into it thinking I wasn't going to learn anything. And after it was over, I learned a lot. So hopefully I, I have something to teach you. So the first question we have to ask, and you'll look at different papers, what is secondary loss of response? It could be clinical, like in a REACH study, we use a pediatric Crohn's disease activity index, or with a lot of adult studies, they use a Crohn's disease activity index. Or it could be symptoms and inflammation, like they do in maybe some of the post-op studies. And last is some studies that say you lose symptoms as well as change therapy. So this is actually, I think, a pretty important slide. What this slide did is looked at the different anti-TNFs that we all have some experience with, adalimumab, infliximab, and surilizumab. And it looks at what happens one year after you start, start therapy with an anti-TNF. And if you look here, one year after starting therapy, 23 to 46 percent of your patients need dose escalation. And 5 to 13 percent of your patients actually have dose discontinuation or drug discontinuation. So during that first year that we start this drug is a very, very important time to optimize its use. You need to be a little bit of like a mother hen here, and you need to be all over your patients when you start infliximab or an anti-TNF. You can't start the anti-TNF and say, all right, start the anti-TNF and look the other way. It's really that first year that makes a big difference with this drug. And this study was adalimumab, but it showed that people lost response to this drug typically within two, uh, two thirds of people lost response to an anti-TNF in the first 12 months of therapy. So again, there's been more data showing this first year is pretty important after you stop to start this drug. So when you lose response, I think you have to verify what do you mean by your loss response? Is it really inflammatory IBD activity? So possible mechanisms for worsening on an anti-TNF. Well, we know uncontrolled IBD inflammation. This is with a low drug level. So it could be loss of anti-TNF activity because of antibodies to your anti-TNF. It could be relentless, relentless TNF flare, and you sort of consume your anti-TNF product. This is often with severe ulcerative colitis, and we'll talk a little bit about the pharmacokinetics of that particular disease could be loss of anti-TNF for some non-immune uh, clearance strategies, or it could be the patient's just not taking the therapy. How about uncontrolled IBD therapy? This is with an adequate drug level. This would imply that the disease has sort of shifted to a different sort of strategy inflammatory uh, mediators. And if this is true, then you need to leave the anti-TNF family and go to another family of therapies. How about non-IBD-related inflammation? Again, good drug levels, a high CRP. Obviously, we all think about things like C. difficile and intestinal infections. Or non-inflammatory uh, mechanisms. So here, adequate drug, no real inflammation going on. Think about strictures. Think about IBS. So when your patient loses response, you need to figure out why, and it usually means working them up again or at least doing a colonoscopy. This is an example of a patient who has a fibrotic stricture. No inflammation here. If this patient, when they develop symptoms, you start to increase the anti-inflammatory therapy, you're doing this patient a disservice. That's not the way to fix this or help this patient. Let's start with prevention. I think most of us know this data. In the old days when infliximab had just come out, we used it as a rescue therapy. You'd give it and you wait till your patient was sick again and you'd give it again. That was sort of an episodic schedule. Now we realize that what we need to do is put people on a fixed schedule and typically every eight weeks. And it shows that patients that are on a fixed schedule are much less likely to develop antibodies to the infliximab than patients who are treated episodically. Now this is looking at the importance of an infliximab trough level at one year. So they looked at outcome measures like clinical remission, CRP less than five, endoscopic improvement greater than 75%. So you could see here that patients who had a detectable infliximab level were much more likely or statistically more likely to accomplish these endpoints than patients who did not have a detectable level. 
How about the Sonic trial? I think most of us know about this study. Again, these were an adult study of newly diagnosed Crohn's patients, where patients were randomized into azathioprine alone, infliximab alone, or azathioprine with infliximab. And the study showed that combination therapy was superior to monotherapy, and then infliximab monotherapy was superior than azathioprine monotherapy. But if you look at the sub-analysis, you could see the patients who had combination therapy they had higher infliximab levels, 3.8, compared to patients who had monotherapy. So this brings up the possibility that optimizing levels with anti-TNF monotherapy could be an alternative to dual therapy. Now this is an old study, and this is in the times when we used to treat people episodically. And what this study showed is that if you had antibodies to infliximab that were less than eight, these patients would require a reinfusion of infliximab every 61 days. But if you have antibodies greater than eight, these patients required um, infusions every 28 days. And this is a PEED study that we had done doing, looking at and sort of finding the same number. It seems like eight to nine of an, uh, an antibody to infliximab seems to be an important number. And here we showed about infusion reactions. Again, higher antibodies, more infusion reactions in pediatrics. Now this is a study I alluded to a little bit earlier. I think all of us have had the experiences when you have that patient admitted to your hospital for severe ulcerative colitis, you give them one dose of infliximab, they get better for like three days and then all of a sudden they're sick again. Why does this happen? Well, we know why this happens, because if we look at the pharmacokinetics of this disease, that patients who have fulminant or severe ulcerative colitis, they have a very high TNF burden. They use up the anti-TNF product. Also, they're probably losing some of the anti-TNF product in the bloody stools. So as this study shows, the clearance of, an, of infliximab in this patient population was 1.4 days. So a half-life of 1.4 days in this population. Why would you expect that the therapy would last more than a few days? So clearly in that patient, the induction therapy of five milligrams per kilo at zero, two, and six weeks just isn't right for that particular patient population. And this is looking at colectomy, and once again, same story. If you have detectable infliximab, you're much less likely to have a colectomy than if you don't have detectable levels. How about dose intensification? In this study, again, looked at the TNF therapies, and with all of these studies, they showed the same thing, that at 12 months, again, as I mentioned before, dose intensification is very common. The thing that's sort of exciting is that you could regain or you could save these patients 50 to 70 percent of the time by increasing the dose. Now, how can you do dose intensification? I mean, a lot of different ways. With infliximab, you could give it a little, a little more often, five milligrams per kilo every six weeks. You could give 7.5 every eight weeks, 10 per kilo every eight weeks, or five per kilo every four weeks. And with adalibumab, maybe 40 every week, 80 every other week, 40 every 10 days. The thing that's important, though, is once you put the patient back into remission, you often can de-escalate. You don't need to stay on those high doses, and I think we sometimes make the mistake that we increased our dose and we let patients sit at that high dose. Think about dropping the dose back down again. Now this study, they escalated or they intensified therapies two different ways. They either increased the dose, which was 10 milligrams per kilo every eight weeks, or they shortened the interview and they used five milligrams per kilo every four weeks. And what they showed is the outcome was essentially the same for sustaining response. So if you were the patient, and maybe if you're the insurance company, you would prefer the 10 milligrams per kilo every eight weeks. But you need to think about the pharmacokinetics when you make these decisions. It seems like the data seems to support that a higher peak level is probably more associated with toxicity. And so when you do do 10 milligrams per kilo every eight weeks, you clearly are having much higher peak levels than if you shorten the interview and do five milligrams per kilo every four weeks. So this particular study, and this is one of the things I'd learned about transient antibodies. I was sort of at the point where I was thinking, you see antibodies, I would move on or do something different. But it seems like some of these antibodies that you could get, antibodies to infliximab, could actually be transient. In this adult study where they looked at 90 patients, 59% of these patients had developed uh, antibodies to infliximab. And this is a retrospective study, and they sort of selected patients to get this number around 60%. 
28% of these patients had transient ATIs. So again, and I'll show you the pharmacokinetics of this, but they also showed from a clinical point of view that patients who had sustained ATIs were very likely to lose response to infliximab and need to discontinue the drug compared to people who had transient ATIs. The thing that's interesting is initially when the antibodies start to develop, the, there's really an overlap between the transient and the sustained group. But as time goes on, patients who had sustained antibodies, as you could see, significantly increase, and the ones that are transient obviously slowly disappear. The next is if you decide to do dose intensification, it needs to result in an increase in infliximab level. And here you could see the LOR is loss of response. In both groups, the uh, levels are low. But of the patients who were successful in regaining response to infliximab were the ones you were able to increase their dose. Now how about this, adding an immunomodulator. So in this study, what they did is they took patients who lost response to infliximab, and the reason they lost it is because they again measured high levels of antibodies to infliximab. They gave them an immunomodulator, either methotrexate, 6-MP, or azathioprine. And as you could see here, the purple line is antibodies to infliximab, and the blue line is infliximab level. You could see after being exposed to the immunomodulator, slowly the patient lost their antibodies to infliximab, and when that happened, there was resurgence of their infliximab level, and there was this correlated with gain of response. So how about other endings we could do sort of predictive, saying that there's going to be a problem. In this particular study, they looked at infliximab trough levels at 14 weeks and 22 weeks. And they showed that if your infliximab level was greater than three, you were much more likely to have a sustained response. And if your infliximab level was less than three, you were much more likely to develop uh, an, an ATI. Now in this study, what the uh, summary of the study really was, is that they showed that the best predictor of loss of response to infliximab is a very low infliximab level. That if your infliximab trough is less than 2.2 at week 14, you have a very high chance of developing antibodies to infliximab. Also a very, very likely that you'll have to discontinue the use of infliximab. So in my practice now, I do check a level at, and maybe we'll get into talking about this, at 14 weeks, I do check a level, and if I have a level that's below three, I do uh, increase my infliximab dose. Also, if you have ATIs that are over 9.1 in this study, it showed it was very unlikely you'd be able to regain response. And again, as I had said, patients who were successful were ones that had an increase in their infliximab level. So what the author suggested is dose escalate if infliximab trough is less than 2.2 at week 14. And dose escalation can be attempted if you have low levels of ATIs. So in summary, if you have a positive ATI, less than 9, you should increase your infliximab dose or maybe add an immunomodulator. If it's greater than 9, you probably should move on to another anti-TNF. Uh, therapy. If you have a th uh, an infliximab level that's therapeutic above three and the patient still has activity, uh, if it is IBD activity, you probably need to move to a different class of therapy. If it's not IBD activity, obviously try to figure out what it is. And if you have less than uh, a low uh, infliximab level of less than three, I would increase my infliximab level or add an immunomodulator. Okay, thank you.